I wasn't going to mention it, but just very, very quickly, there was that last story. Let me just move my microphone here. It sounds like my knee's bending, doesn't it? Yeah, that same creaking noise. It was, a, it was sitting off to the side here a little bit, and so I wanted to make sure it was in front of me. There was a story at the tail end of the Fox newscast that said that in Washington, the local government, that is the city government, is allowing people to smoke marijuana openly and do these things in defiance of the federal government. Okay. Try doing that out in the Mountain West when you want to defy them grazing cattle or something on, uh, on lands you've traditionally grazed your cattle on, but they claim they own. It's okay if you're a liberal to go out and smoke the wacky weed in defiance of law, but if you do anything that might be closer to what our founding fathers thought about our liberties, then you're a bad guy, according to the, the American left. I haven't figured that one out yet. But that's a story for another day. We have so much to talk about today, and a story on the local level that, well, I'm just going to go into it in a couple of minutes. We do have some other things going on today as well. I saw a piece last night online from Cornell University, which is in a very, very beautiful place in the Finger Lakes region of New York State, right on the south end of Cuga Lake, which is a lake about 800 feet deep, but only about 200 feet wide, and about 40 miles going north to south. And this big college there, an Ivy League school, as they claim, has done a study, and it asks where's the best place to live in the case of a zombie attack. Okay, it, it probably doesn't sound as ridiculous. What they're doing is they're gaming for a disease pandemic. But you'd be surprised where the safest place might be in the United States. We'll get to that a little bit later in the program if we get an opportunity. Also, expect a little law enforcement in the studio today. Speaking of dope smoking, some of my colleagues are going to have to put their baggies away for a few minutes. Well, I'm not naming anyone. I mean, you, certainly not me. But I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to call anybody else out on the on the air about this. And finally, the other really big story, the top story, which is the name of the program in the first place is uh, something we mentioned yesterday just at the very top of the show. We didn't have a lot of detail. We didn't have a lot of information on this. But my telephone lines were burning after the program because I'd left a couple of messages with the principal at, uh, at a local school, actually just down the street from our studios, Oregon Trail Elementary School on Park Avenue here in Twin Falls. And we played phone tag for a while. And then I got a call instead and was left a message in an email by a spokesperson, uh, known in the news business as the public relations flack, telling me I needed to go through the proper channels, as if there's some sort of law that forces me to go through the proper channels, and uh, she would be the proper channels on this particular story, and that is uh, the recitation of quotes by Muhammad during morning announcements on Tuesday. Now, again, you can look at this and say it's a historical figure. Oh, no problem. Are they also quoting Elijah or Elisha? Or are they quoting Moses or Jesus? Or are they quoting uh, the Gita? Or are they quoting the Torah? I, I don't think they're doing any of those things. But I got an answer from the school district as to what exactly was taking place. And uh, once more, you have people who are doing things because their hearts, I suppose, are in the right places, but they may not be thinking on a global perspective certain public attitudes right now. And parents may not be consulted on this. I'm sure they aren't consulted on it. It's from something called Project Wisdom. And this is a daily lesson or a daily reminder that they have when they do the public address announcements at the school. Project Wisdom. And it's founded or funded by a great many groups in Washington who have a lot of political clout, and they call it character education. Because since we, we can't talk about Christianity in schools and right and wrong related to the, the Judeo-Christian ethics that built this country, we still have to have character education because once they, they kick Christianity out of schools, they discovered, well, hey, kids still aren't getting a lot of this at home, so they developed character education. In other words, we know better than parents in the first place, so we'll teach your children about what's right and wrong. And this is funded by a number of different organizations that, that do this for schools all over the country. Some of them, through grant money, are very well-intentioned organizations. Others, like the Rand Corporation, have proposed a national police force to keep order in the United States. Yeah, you know what they're thinking of down the road. <laughs> Once we take control, this is what we're going to be able to do. So you've got these type of people who are behind this, and your schools probably aren't even aware of it. This is what they did the other day over the PA system. And I'm reading directly from this lesson from Project Wisdom. The subject on Tuesday was charity, kindness, and gratitude. 
And this is what the principal was reading. What do you think of when you hear the word charity? Do you think of money you or your parents give to the poor? Do you think of blankets passed out to the homeless? These really are acts of charity, but charity is much more than giving things to those in need. Listen to the words from Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And then there is, in bold lettering here, I guess this is a quote. There are no quotation marks, but it says, Every good act is charity. And then the writer at the, at the uh, call it the, the, the character education project, whatever you want to label it, says, in other words, every time we do something good, we are being charitable. Why? Because every good act helps those around us. Every good act ripples out into the world and helps everybody. Today, be grateful for all that you have and be kind and charitable to others. Do something especially good for someone else. Kind of like watching an episode of Barney. I love you, you love me, we're a great big family. Two plus two is four, two plus two is four, two plus two is four. So you, you get what they're trying to do here when you, when you hear something like this. I had a friend of mine look this over last night, and he wrote me and said, that's not a quote from Muhammad. <laughs> what? It's not even a quote from Muhammad. He says it's a quote from Moliere. Who is Moliere? Well, Moliere was a French actor. He's been dead about 350 years. He was, he was acting in France in various plays and shows, which at that time were only seen by the nobility anyway, back even before King Louis XIV, the Sun King, built Versailles. And Moliere apparently said, every good act is charity, and then it's actually part of a longer statement that he made during the course of his acting career and some writings he did alongside of that. So doesn't it make you, for just a few minutes, question what's going on here? First of all, <laughs> they're, they're telling the children, hey, here's a quote from this wonderful guy, Muhammad, whose adherents right now are chopping the heads off Christians and burning Christians in cages and crucifying people, and who actually in his own book said, when he said something like this, if he did say something like this, also said, when you come across the infidel, chop off their hands, chop off their feet, stake them to a cross, and burn them. Oh, okay. Uh, but that's beside the point. My guy, on the other hand, said, forgive your enemies. This is what's going on. Is there some effort in local schools to try and indoctrinate the children and, and make them forget any bad pictures they may see on TV when they go home and their parents are watching the coverage of what's going on halfway around the world? Because I don't think anyone in the school system actually is thinking this through. But the other part of this is, if, if it's not even a quote from Muhammad, then why would he be cited in this? Why would we try to say, hey, he was a really nice fellow, other than all the wars he led and all the people he killed? But aside from that, so if you have some thoughts on this today, and perhaps your children attend school there, maybe you're all for it. On the other hand, maybe you've reached that point where you've, you've just said to yourself, you know what, I really wish the school would consult me as a parent before they go ahead and they do something like this. It's 8.15. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. And it's also a somewhat warm morning. We've had some snow showers, nothing sticking to the ground in the immediate area of our studios. I have to be careful when I say that because somebody will phone in and say, hey, 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 I'm out in Buell and it's snowing here. What are you talking about? Well, I'm not in Buell. I'm sitting in a little room with no windows in Twin Falls. So there you go. Uh, the telephone number to reach our program, 736-0300. It's 816, and you're next on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Seems to me like they're trying to get in God we trust out of the schools, and now we turn around and replace it with Mohammed. Yeah, isn't that an interesting twist? Excuse me? You know, and a lot of these people are put in by us, the taxpayers, and are supposed to be taking care of our interests. And it's strike two. Just a thought. Okay. Thank, Thank you much. You. Thank you. I thought there was something else coming there at the end of that, but that's fine. Uh, he, 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 got his, he got his point across very, very well. We have another caller with us this morning on the air. In fact, uh, you'll be heard on not only News Radio 1310 KLIX, but of course across the web at NewsRadio1310.com. And you're up next. What's on your mind? Well, um, my opinion is it's called magic. Smoke and mirrors. Uh, what they're doing is no different than what Congress does to us. They say one thing on the air and do something behind our backs. The same thing. 
And I have to say this too, and I thank you for the call. When we are talking about what's going on in the schools, publicly funded, we should point out, these are not private organizations, but publicly funded, they always get a little uh, angry when something like this happens, and then they come back to people like me and say, you've got to go through the proper channels. Just because somebody told me about it and I mentioned it, then I'm the bad guy in their mind. They never will look at this themselves and say, maybe we shouldn't have done this in the first place. I remember uh, in another state long, long ago working at another radio station where there was a school principal and he was having affairs with some of the students, which sent him to prison, of course, eventually. But when it got reported, the school board members and the administrators refused to talk to any of the local media. Well, we weren't raping the students, and the public wouldn't have known unless we mentioned it. Now, this, on scale of that, is somewhat small. No one is being hurt physically here. But on the other hand, some parents are not going to be comfortable with Islamic proselytizing in elementary schools, and they're going to see it that way. And if the school district is angry because we're talking about it, then maybe the school district should have been thinking about this a wee bit beforehand and stopped with the, uh, you've got to go through the proper channels. Are you going to tell parents the same thing when they show up at the school board meeting and ask, hey, what are you doing to our kids? And how come I don't know about this? And that's where they're going to be put on the spot. And you know what usually happens? They'll sit there and they'll sulk and skulk and, and, and try to blame it on someone else. But ultimately, the buck has to stop somewhere within that school system, either at the local school or either at the district offices. And, and my guess is it's going to take a long time for these people to come to that realization. Plus, you know, hey, it's free. They get all of this great stuff that they can read over the PA system that someone else paid for, like the Rand Corporation, which is talking about uh, uh, creating a, a system in this country similar to some totalitarian state. Well, hey, why not? Did they did they ask where the money came from? Sure, they didn't. I mean, the money was there. It's like take it. That's how it works. Nobody even bothered to investigate that. Nineteen minutes after eight o'clock, we have a, a short uh, break ahead just for some messages from some of our fine sponsors. The snow that we're seeing over the area is actually heavier to the south now toward Salt Lake, but we still may have another hour, hour and a half of it coming through. Don't expect anything really heavy on the ground. The weather over the next few days. Mm, maybe not quite like it's been the last three weeks. A little cooler, some clouds. But really, after today, no serious threat of any uh, any huge washouts. So if you've got some plans and you want to do some things outside, a good weekend coming up for that. Just you know, put on a sweater while you're doing it. We've got plenty more coming up. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX, as well as News Radio 1310.com, which means you can hear us anywhere around the world. Did you know there's another effort to repeal daylight savings time in Idaho? Probably won't go very far either. Uh, after all, somebody in Washington said it was a good idea, so we have to do it. Our next guest is a man atop the news, uh, Ken Menzel. <laughs> I just said, right. can't be much problems, though, really, to the weather this morning. And he said, well, actually. <laughs> so you got to be a little careful out there. Yeah, just be a little careful. There's a school bus crash over in Buell, so you might want to avoid the area of uh, Sawtooth and Clear Lakes for now. Just the deputies will be out there for a while trying to get that figured out. So No serious injuries or anything? No, really. no injuries. Good, good news there. Uh, Ken Mensel, sergeant with the Twin Falls County Sheriff's Department, joins us just about every Thursday morning. And we talk about, uh, well, Most Wanted and some other issues like that, too. Before you get to those names this week, Benito posted, well, it may not have been Benito, but usually he does most of the heavy lifting around here on the website. Uh, Twin Falls uh, Sheriff's Department needs help with December theft. And there's actually a uh, some surveillance photograph, uh, a photograph here, I guess, from a local, was it the mall? Or somewhere in the area where it shows uh, shows something going on. Are you, are you aware of what he's talking about with that? You know, I, I haven't seen what Benito posted on there, and I've been out of uh, okay. the Twin Falls area for the last week. But uh, take a look at that article, and if you have information that can help us with that, certainly call Crime Stoppers at 732-5387. You could be eligible for a re reward if it leads us to... Uh, solving some of those theft issues. We won't go into the details, but you were sent to um, a meeting out of state, and uh, you had to go to Sin City. I did. I, I just returned from Las Vegas for a hostage negotiators conference, and uh, it's interesting that the topic you were discussing this morning was on Islam and, and Muslim, and uh, that was one of the uh, topics that one of our course instructors, who was a 
one of the top commanders for special forces over in Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and it was interesting to hear him in a, you know, a crash course of four hours uh, teach 160 different law enforcement officers from 37 states about Muhammad and uh, how all of that started and, and came to pass and, and the difference, you know, the crash course and the difference between Sunni and the Shia and, and things to look for from a law enforcement perspective. And it, it'll really open your eyes once you start to study those types of things and understand uh, the philosophy behind the Muslim religion and more more importantly, uh, what's going on with Muslim extremists? Of course, it's also it's also important that uh, from thirty seven different states, the networking that goes on there, discussing hostage negotiation. Absolutely. Everybody's probably got some good ideas. Yes, yeah, it's a very great way for us to network with uh, law enforcement agencies from uh, Philadelphia to Detroit to Miami. Uh, it's a great networking tool and, and a great opportunity to just sit down after class and and talk with other law enforcement officers about the trends they're seeing throughout our country. Yeah, I was going to say the other part, a benefit of that in Las Vegas, too, is they've got a lot of good buffets. Yeah, absolutely. I think I did gain a little weight. <laughs> I never can pass one up. 26 minutes after 8 o'clock, and it's 35 at our studios. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX. At also News 13.com you can uh, you can hear us anywhere around the world. You come in just about every time you're here, you've got a couple of names of people that the department is looking for. And I didn't fail you today. I brought a couple more with me. Uh-huh. Uh, we're looking for... Terry Ann Crystal Jenkins. Uh, her date of birth is 5 12 1970. That puts her about 44 years of age. She's 5'5. Five, five. Uh, she weighs about 169 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. She's got a $25,000 warrant for possession or delivery of a controlled substance. Uh, she's located in the Shoshone area, so if anybody out there knows where Miss Terry Ann is at, uh, please feel free to call us at 735 1911. That's our dispatch office. Uh, they can help us. Uh, put us on the right track so that we can locate her and bring her in so that she can see the judge and get these uh, things taken care of. Uh, the other phone number you can call is 732-5387. That's the number for Crime Stoppers. Uh, the next individual we're looking for is Hunter Castile. His first name is spelled H-U-N-N-E-R. He's out of the Jerome area. His date of birth is 8-8 eight, eight of 88, which makes him about 26 years of age. He's 6 foot tall, weighs about 160 with black hair and hazel eyes. His warrant is for $75,000. It's a felony warrant for possession of a controlled substance. Again, with um, Mr. Castile or Ms. Jenkins, the numbers to call are 732-5387. That's Crime Stoppers or 735-1911. You can remain anonymous and receive a cash reward for information that leads us to be able to bring those individuals to jail so that they can face the charges in court. Of course, a lot of people will just do it anyway, money or not involved in a reward because they want to get these people off the streets. Absolutely. You know, sometimes we see that a lot of the times these individuals simply missed a court date and didn't even realize it, didn't realize they have a warrant. So uh, it's great to get this information out there so that uh, if they are listening, they can turn themselves in. Or if somebody knows where they're at, uh, give us a hand in, in making the process a little easier and expedite that. I was going to say when you, you referenced uh, uh, people out in the Jerome area, I've got about a minute in a segment, but... Uh, that arrest a couple of weeks ago following the homicide in the city. You want to talk about networking and good work between departments, two sheriff's departments and city police all working together and wrap that thing up in less than 12 hours or so. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing that we can be very proud of with our law enforcement in the Magic Valley. Uh, everybody from police departments, uh, whether it's a large department or small departments in the sheriff's offices in the area, we all work together very well. It's a, it's a really fine-tuned instrument there's always room for improvement, but we do so well with each other. There's a lot of respect back and forth between the agencies, and it's great to see the networking and the camaraderie that takes place between every agency in our valley. It's, it's a good place to work. I want to thank you for coming by, and uh, we'll see you again actually pretty soon because of the, this is the last end of the month, and so yes. we'll kick this off again in the next couple of weeks. Maybe I've got to look at the schedule. You probably know it better than I do. Sounds good. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> All right, super. Sergeant Ken Menzel joining us, Twin Falls County Sheriff's Department. Coming up on 8.30, 35 right now is the temperature. And uh, hey, got a couple of other things I wanted to mention this morning too quickly if I could. Uh, one is an effort to, uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, to roll back daylight savings time in the state of Idaho. Also, up in the northern part of the state, some Republicans are saying perhaps we need to designate Idaho as a Christian state. More details on that coming up a bit later on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX. I was mentioning a story a couple of minutes ago, and uh, if you were with us at the top of the show, 
We were talking about what was uh, taking place at a local elementary school. Good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, I think that you still have to talk about this and wonder what sort of direction are we going. And, you know, it's one day out of maybe just 200 in a school year or 180 in a school year, and, and it should be just a blip on the map. But once again, I think it, it, it tells you that we have to have parents more involved. And if parents are more involved, and that means they have to go to meetings, that means they have to know the teachers, that means they have to even go to school board meetings if they get the chance now and then. We're not talking about thousands of people going just to sit there and observe. But if, you, if, you're, if you're active with your kid's school, you'll know a lot more of these things that are going on. And so to sit here, it would be unfair just to sit here and rap all day long on a school and the school district when a mom and dad or just mom, or just dad, and it happens, I know, but that they have to take a bit more of a proactive interest, too, in the schools and what's going on there, and you might know about these things more often in advance, and perhaps if you sit down and actually talk about it with the staff there, it might make sense as to what's going on. Uh, but if you'd like to know more about this, if you go to our, our, our Facebook page, KLIX, if you go there, uh, you can take a look at this. Uh, I have uh, the details of what actually was said in the school on Tuesday morning over the PA system, where it was said to be a, a quote from the Prophet Muhammad uh, as part of a character education uh, of course that the kids uh, listen to every morning. It's just a little nugget that they get every morning before they actually start working in class. And so I've posted it there. There have been more than 200 views on that already. And uh, if you need a little background, you can find it there. Also, speaking of schools, we need to get kids back and forth to school, and that means in many cases they get on a bus in the morning, and then in the afternoon they get back on the bus to come home. And there's always a need for people to be driving these school buses. It's not the easiest job, but there are people who will also train you, such as Western States Bus Services, where they're hiring part-time bus drivers right now, split shifts five days per week, summer's off, and scheduled no school days. Pay is $10.75 per hour. Apply today by contacting 733 8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. I just, I, I bring up a couple of small things uh, during the program periodically just to uh, remind you that that we do have, I think in some cases, uh, a much bigger responsibility, not just on the local level and not just with your children, but really on a global level too as well, because we're all so heavily tied in now. And I think I've got a couple of telephone callers with us, 736-0300. And uh, you're on the air on News Radio 1310 KLIX and Top Story at 837. And a good morning. All right, let's try our next caller. And you're up next on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And you're on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story. You know, Bill, I, I'd like to try to understand this in a in a state that is probably mostly Christians. And I know we're, we're the type of people that live and let live and forgive and everything else, but the minority are pushing their will on the majority. I mean, if this was a opposite deal and something on a PA system said, we're going to read you a verse out of the Bible of what Christ said, somebody would be jumping up and going, you can't do that. It's offending me. Bingo. Uh, you know, well, I think that we as Christians, when that happens, should stand up in our chair and say, that offends me. And maybe something will happen. Well, we've been saying we're offended for more than 50 years since that 1962 court decision on school prayer, and nothing seems to work. Yeah, but the, the thing is, is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We may say something, but we don't squeak. They they squeak to the point that they grind. They sound like a bearing that's ready to break. You know what the difference is? If they complain, uh, you've got mainstream media shows up and takes their pictures sobbing or whatever other type of picture they can get uh, because of their complaints and says, oh, these poor people, these poor oppressed uh, victims, uh, minority victims. And on the other hand, if it comes down to Christians, it's like, well, there they go again, trying to force everybody to do, live like they yeah. do. And you know that, that the fact of the matter is, in a lot of these other religions, they're a lot more strict when it comes to a lot of these social issues than Christians are. Right, and, and well, I had, there's another school in our valley that this Christmas would not say anything about Christ or anything else, 
because it might offend somebody, and that was ridiculous. In in Texas, there was a school that didn't do haven't didn't have pilgrims up for Thanksgiving because uh, the parent was told that they were considered the first terrorist. Yeah, I, I, I recall that story. I thank you. There was a school in Texas, if you recall, a few years ago where they barred the use of red and green napkins because, well, those are Christmas colors. Really? Where in the Bible does it say, and remember, use red and green napkins? <laughs> How long can you hold that toke? Uh, I don't know. Somebody out there has been smoking the ganja, that's for sure. I just looked up at the monitor here on Fox TV and... Islamic terrorists are smashing uh, museum artifacts in Iraq. Go figure. Yeah, but let's have another quote from them, please, at school. There was a fellow by the name of William Kilpatrick, and he taught for many years at Boston College. That's in Boston, Massachusetts, in case anyone was wondering. And he has written books such as Why Johnny Can't Tell Right from Wrong and Christianity, Islam, and Atheism, The Struggle for the Soul of the West. I've been reading his work for years in various publications. Today, there is a story that he has written for Crisis. And he says, according to a report in the Daily Mail, that being an English newspaper, there are more Muslim than Christian children in Birmingham, England's second largest city. The same is true in a number of other large and mid-sized cities in uh, Luton, Leicester, Bradford, and Slough. At least three boroughs in London have more Muslim than Christian children, including Tower Hamlets, which has an overall population of 273,000. Most Americans, he says, I dare say, don't know about these demographic shifts in the UK. It's also a good bet that they don't know about the 1,400, that's 1,400 child rape victims of Muslim gangs in the mid-sized city of Rotherham in England. Nor is it likely that Americans are aware of a plot by Muslim fundamentalists to Islamize as many as 25 of Birmingham, England's schools. I guess you have to have Sharia law in the schools now. Oh, I see that you were mouthing off to your teacher. Off, off goes your hand. And that'll be the end of it. Now, look, I know that there are people in these schools who say we have to make these Muslim students feel welcome while they're here. But on the other hand, when their co-religionists are now going around the world slaughtering everybody in their sight, you might understand why we would be just a little bit antsy about all of this. 45 minutes after 8 o'clock. 35 at our studios. Bill Colley with you on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio 1310.com, meeting you can hear us anywhere around the world. We have a caller joining us, and you're up next. What's your question or comment? Yeah, hello, Bill. Uh, your last caller was suggesting that Christians actually do their duty. You know, before next time, they'll probably be calling in saying we should get rid of our driver's license and Social Security number because the Scripture says that we're not supposed to be yoked together with unbelievers. Imagine that. Yeah. Uh, but then again, that part of what we believe is ignored. So I, I, I just, I, I think that what we're dealing with here is an effort by liberal America to just simply, as I said the other day, to simply try to lump everybody in of religious faith together, this notion that all faiths are equal. Well, if all faiths are true, then the other part of that would be, that couplet would be, then no faiths are true, right? When you think about that for a moment. If everyone says, well, I've got the truth, and we all say, all right, you do, then nobody would, because there'd be all these competing ideas out there. And you're up next. You're on the air at 846, and uh, what's on your mind? Are you talking to me? Yes, I am. Oh, cool. Um, well, a while back, Obama made a, a speech saying how much the Muslims had commu uh, contributed to our, the making of our country. I was listening to a um, man, his name is David Barton. He is an incredible historian. And the Muslims, back in the day, was the, one of the largest slave traders. And a great many of the slaves that arrived on the shores here were originally Muslims before becoming Christians. Uh-huh. But the Muslims were slave traders. Sure. <laughs> They ran the big, uh, the big uh, castles and along the coast of West Africa, where they, they, they profited very, very well from actually selling their neighbors. Thank you much for the call. I mean, today they're selling people. They're selling schoolgirls in Nigeria, or they're strapping bombs to those schoolgirls who were Christian just a short while ago, before they were abducted, ages six to about twelve. Now they're strapping bombs on them. Now that they've been forced to convert to Islam, 
and they're being made martyrs. They send them into a market somewhere and have them blow themselves up along with everybody else there. Yeah, we're dealing with some really, really enlightened people here. Let's have a couple more quotes from them in our local schools. And you're on the air with Bill Colley on News Radio 1310 KLIX. What's up with you? Well, Bill, I was uh, reading about the significance of Baghdad falling and what it might mean, especially with you know with ISIS there, literally just sitting on the outskirts of Baghdad, waiting to take it. And it's historically speaking and scripturally, you know, projecting uh, what could happen. And I just was wondering how you felt about that. You know, one more thing quickly. You know, we as Christians, when we try to back off and allow, try, try to be meek, and it's not a tasteful, uh, you know, thing to do. In other words, fighting the fight is distasteful. It's not fun. But when we create a void because we back off, we allow whatever the hell it is to come in. And, and that, in this case, is the hardest working religion on earth, Islam. And so these people are committed like hell wouldn't have it. And if we think that somehow this is going to back away and change, we are barking up the wrong tree. Well, and I thank you for the call. And if, if Baghdad falls, which looks like it could happen, we were talking just about uh, two weeks ago about a military force to try and take care of this problem in that part of the world. And and then all of your members of the House and Senate went home for a week. So how urgent really was it for them? And they're so gun-shy that the New York Times, the Washington Post, and MSDNC will start caterwauling and screaming again about war and how nasty we are, imperialist America, if we get involved in something like this. Plus, the libertarians aren't on board with it. They don't care. And most of them are, are fairly godless themselves. They don't care that some Christian gets a head lopped off or, or that a million Christians get their heads lopped off halfway around the world. So that's not an issue to them. So you've got, you've got members of Congress who are talking tough about it, but they're not really doing anything about it. It may be months before they actually act on this resolution the president wants, this use of force resolution, which again is not going to deal much with boots on the ground. Alan West was saying the other day, there's no other way about it. You've got to have boots on the ground. West is one of those people who has been studying this enemy, which is really not just a faith. It's a political system, as people remind us. He has been studying them for decades. And he says, you, you, you've got to do it. You've got to go in there with total war on your mind in order to take care of it, to save that part of the planet. Now, we read in the last few days at a great many newspapers around the country, Washington Times had a big story about it the other day, that the military has been gutted to the point where just 10 years ago we could fight wars on two fronts, maybe three. Now we're down to one, and we might not be able to do that as well as we used to. The Chinese may have more submarines in the seas now than we do. So we, we have very quickly, we have downsized that military, plus we have, we have politicized the officer corps. Those people who actually had ideas about fighting and winning wars are gone now. And now what we have is Obama sycophants and people who want to go around the world and build hospitals and schools and, you know, sing kumbaya with the enemy. We're, we're dealing more and more with that. So we do not have the uh, uh, opportunity, perhaps, to even go in there and clean this up, even if we wanted to. A friend of mine who was a biblical scholar, his father had been a classmate of Billy Graham's when they were young and was actually offered a job as the singer by Billy Graham's crusade. His name was uh, uh, the Reverend uh, uh, Jim Plack. And, and Jim Plack decided to go into just preaching instead. And he, he, did, uh, he did preaching in churches throughout rural Pennsylvania and then eventually the Philadelphia area. And, uh, and Billy Graham decided to hire someone else who became quite legendary uh, as the singer uh, George Beverly Shea in the Crusades that he was doing. But Reverend Plack's son, Phil, worked with me at a radio station many, many years ago. Phil used to actually be the program director of uh, the largest Christian radio station in New York City many, many years ago. And Phil said, if you look at, if you look at biblical prophecy, there is no United States in there. Okay, we will not have the military to go and fight, in other words. Or the United States may have dissolved by then. Who knows? But I also remember from my own reading at college, we had a philosophy course where, of all things, we actually got to read, it was an assigned book, Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, written in 1969, where he references the Chinese getting involved, sweeping across uh, Southern Asia. And so and eventually there'll be this massive battle at Al Megiddo, 
which is not far from Syria, right up in that area in, in Israel, Syria, Golan Heights, not far from any of that. And you've got these people from ISIS who, of course, are pretty well taking over great swaths of uh, Syria as well as Iraq. So yes, it could all be playing out. It doesn't have to. That's the thing. It doesn't have to play out right now. But we have to have the will to go in and stop it. I was reading a, a, a website last night called Word, and a woman by the name of Jamie Dean had a piece that says, the Egyptians beheaded by Islamic State militants were family men who died for their Christian faith. And she literally walks you through who they were, the 21 souls who were lost that day on that beach telling you their backgrounds. Many of them were people who were looking to make a little extra money so they could buy a home for their families. Another was a, a man who'd gone to find a, a job to make extra money, and while he was away, his wife gave birth to a baby that he never got a chance to see. Despite, she writes, the clear declaration of war against Christians, the Obama White House offered generic condolences. A White House statement condemned the murder of the 21 Egyptian citizens, but never mentioned their Christian identity. The omission follows of a long-standing pattern of White House officials downplaying the radical Islamist agenda of jihadists wreaking havoc across the Middle East. And here in our schools, we're quoting their, their founder. Somebody tried to tell me yesterday, he's not the founder of Islam. He, he's just the end game, if you will. All of the other prophets of the Old Testament uh, and then Jesus, the prophet Jesus, and then the final revelation from Muhammad. I said, well, if you're, if you're of the Islamic faith, you may believe that. I'm not, so therefore he is the founder of Islam. He's not a prophet to me. We have another caller with us. You're up next. You're on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story. It is 35 in our studios at 854. What's on your mind? Well, what's on my mind is the peace. How does peace be achieved in a world that is trying to take over everyone. There's only one way, and we're going the opposite direction. If you want peace, you've got to have the best army that nobody wants to take on. Yes. If they don't want to take on your army, you're safe. If you weaken yourself... They're going to try and take you over. That is why we became a superpower, because when we came here, we had the will to defend our rights and freedoms, and we were willing to lay down our life for it. And we've turned into a bunch of wusses that think it's just the opposite, and that is what's going to bring war to our shores. I thank you much for the call. And again, the, the people on the other side of the world... They, their cultures look at that weakness and they judge you by it. They judge people giving speeches at Cairo University saying that the United States is an atheist nation and doesn't want to get involved in any of this. They judge you by that and see you as weak. Um, look, I don't believe we need to be the policemen of the world. But at the moment, if they take Libya, again, we brought this up yesterday, they'll be able to start shelling American merchant and naval ships off, off the coast in the Mediterranean. It will. It will come to us. War will find us. Churchill said that to Chamberlain. He said, you know, you don't have time to prepare. Chamberlain kept saying, I need more time. He said, no, it's going to find you before you find it. It's 856. You're on KLIX. Good morning. Hey, good morning, sir. Um, I, as a retired veteran, I do want to uh, somewhat echo that last caller's comments. Uh, we have the best military in the world presently, uh, bar none. We may not have the largest but I do believe we have one of the best. And But he's exactly correct. We, we like the will. It's an, it, I, I believe it started back in the Korean War, where as, as a national entity, we started, well, not as a national entity, I should say, as politicians, we started backing off on total commitment when it came to warfare. Um, war is an ugly, dirty business. It's, it's all about killing people and breaking things, and getting the other guy to blink first. That's exactly the essence of warfare is getting the other person to say, I really do not want to mess with you anymore. We have not done that to a limited extent in Korea, you know, lesser in Vietnam, and then so on and so forth, and that's why we're having these, it's soon to be, or it is, decades-long conflicts that we're in. 
because we lack the will to go and do the horrible, terrible things that are required when it comes to warfare. Yeah, and I think I thank you for the call. I think people have diagnosed it very well this morning. Going back to Korea when Douglas MacArthur said, look, we got to go clean out that nest of communists once and for all. And President Truman said, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, of course, it, it ruined his chances for re-election either way. But MacArthur, looking back on it, if we'd allowed him to do that, uh, this would be the preeminent nation on earth still, and we wouldn't be worried, as Mike Huckabee said yesterday, about China overtaking us by 2049 as the preeminent nation on the planet. And you know people are going to love to live under that system, aren't they? For all the belly aching and bad mouthing they do about the good old USA. Can you imagine what that gang of thieves, and they like to thieve uh, your organs so the Politburo members can use them for transplants. We've got more coming up. Idaho, a Christian state. Some people say it needs to be labeled that. Is, is Idaho a Christian state? Now, there's a question that I think some people are being asked around the country. And I, I say that because yesterday afternoon I got a, I got a message from a friend of mine and said, give me a call at work. And he's a pretty bright guy. He's a lawyer and he used to uh, be an executive at the National with the Boy Scouts of America. He's got quite an interesting background. Other than the fact that he's a Philadelphia Eagles fan, he's a pretty okay guy. Well, Philadelphia sports fan altogether, so all right, he's somewhat of a good guy. But he, he got in touch with me, and he said, what's this uh, business about Idaho being a Christian state? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you haven't seen the story yet. Normally, I don't miss anything like that. So after I got off the telephone, I started doing a search on the computer, and I saw several stories related to this. Republicans shall measure labeling Idaho a Christian state. Now, that headline is from Reuters. It's also misleading. Oh, here go those Republicans, all of them again. Well, it's not all of them, first of all, although it's a pretty good number of them in one Idaho county, and I think their hearts are definitely in the right places on all of this. And frankly, back in the day before the federal government decided it was going to take over and run this totalitarian government that it has now, uh, I almost said state, but I don't want to confuse you because we aren't provinces, we are 50 states. In other words, the notion was a sovereignty among these 50 states in a union to protect themselves when it came to time of war and the like. Sort of like one big NATO, right? Although working better than NATO, you would hope. Eight minutes after nine o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Online means you can hear us anywhere all over the world. You can also check out all of the latest headlines there from News Radio 1310 KLIX. So Reuters puts out this headline, and it turns out it's just one actually small county. All right, it might be geographically large, but not overly crowded. Kootenai County says the measure ignited a rare and emotionally charged debate in the Republican stronghold of northern Idaho, a state where Republicans have long held sway, and it says in which opponents said they felt unjustly portrayed as anti-Christian. In other words, uh, people who were opposed to the law felt that if they opposed it, that they would be viewed as being uh, unbiblical, unchristian, unchurched, when in fact the people who were proposing it had something entirely other in mind. And the proposal, according to Reuters, says, sought that Idaho be, quote, formally and specifically declared a Christian state, unquote, guided by a Judeo-Christian faith reflected in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, where all authority and power is attributed to God. Now, it wasn't going to be law. They weren't looking to enforce this. They weren't going to be going around like an Islamic Republic forcing you to convert. They just want it acknowledged. In other words, it's, it's, it's what you'd call a non-binding resolution or something along those lines. Perhaps I, I, my, my euphemism for it isn't quite correct, but you get the idea. They weren't going to be going around rounding people up, capturing them, parading them in cages through the streets, threatening to burn them or crucify them or chop their heads off if they didn't convert to Christianity. But they want you to think that in mainstream media, don't they? Backer said it was designed to address what they consider strident attacks on the Christian faith in the United States, which they say is evidenced by the absence of Christian practices and symbols in public institutions such as schools. Were you with us at the beginning of the last hour? 
If you were not, let me just remind you, Tuesday morning at Oregon Trail Elementary School, just down the street, a block to a block and a half from the radio station, during the morning announcements, the students heard this. What do you think of when you hear the word charity? Do you think of money you or your parents give to the poor? Do you think of blankets passed out to the homeless? These really are acts of charity, but charity is much more than giving things to those in need. Listen to the words from Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Every good act is charity. In other words, every time we do something good, we are being charitable. Why? Because every good act helps those around us. Every good act ripples out into the world and helps everybody. Today, be grateful for all that you have and be kind and charitable to others. Do something especially good for someone else. Could, could they actually someday actually, uh, I just want to bring this up. Could they bring uh, the Beatitudes in and, and reference those? Would that work or would that be quickly drummed out of schools because of its Christian nature? The ACLU would be in here and all of the other radical lefties screaming and yelling it had to come to an end and then the school would buckle no matter what the community standard was because, of course, the schools are now run by politicians, not necessarily by educators. Although many people would say there's not a whole lot of difference once you get to the top. But I, I bring that up because it, it, it shows you that at least there is some reference to somebody's religion in Idaho schools. And it's not that of the majority. There you go again. I, I, if, if you were not with us earlier, and I have mentioned this at our KLIX Facebook page, and I have mentioned it on air, as it turns out, a friend of mine says that quote isn't actually from Muhammad in the first place. He says, it is from a 300-year-old, uh, almost 400-year-old French actor. He's long dead by the name of Moliere. So, unless he was quoting Muhammad, although I don't know how a French actor in 1650 would have really had all that much access. And I don't think the, in Europe at that time, Muslim uh, faith and the Quran were really considered to be something that you wanted to be professing. Uh, Europe was an entirely different place, too, at the time. It was a bulwark against the incursions of these people who are trying to destroy our civilization. That's what it comes down to. So are these people in northern Idaho wrong to at least have us acknowledge that? Once more, they are not saying they're going to kick down anybody's door and make anybody convert. But is it wrong that they would say, we need to acknowledge that? We at least need to acknowledge that in government. We need to acknowledge it in our schools and perhaps even on our streets, because religion is not something, your faith is not something that you do compartmentalized for one hour every week. Oh, I know Lefty thinks it should be, but it's simply simply not supposed to work that way. 914, Bill Colley with you on News Radio 1310 KLIX, NewsRadio1310.com online. You can also reach our program today, 736-0300, 736-0300. I happen to see, a, a, well, I want to get to this maybe in more depth a little bit later in the program, or on another day to give it more attention. You may re recall the story of the fire chief in Atlanta, Georgia. He was fired. He, he's a very well-schooled individual. He'd worked actually in the Obama White House for a time. The man is a very devout Christian, and because of that, he believes in, in what the Bible tells him about life, and between the relationships we develop between men and women, or men and men, and women and women. And because of those Christian beliefs, he had written a book. Now, he did not, he, he, the book actually points out that he feels that there are certain lifestyles that people live that are going to cause them great harm when it comes time for the afterlife. But as it turns out, he was fired because, and it was applauded by the left, he was fired because it was said he was making members of the LGBT community who serve in the fire department nervous and making them uncomfortable. Even though he didn't go out and say, you must read my book. He simply, when a handful of people in the fire department said, could I get a copy of your book? He said, well, sure, here you go. So voluntarily they asked for a copy and voluntarily he provided it. It was nothing that he was doing mandatorily. There was nothing that was being forced upon anyone. But because he made people feel uncomfortable, he was fired by the mayor of his city. 
And then the New York Times squawked what a great thing that was. Here's the thing. The laws against discrimination say you are protected against actual discrimination, not by the discomfort you may feel when somebody that works with you believes something else. Once more, this is where Christians are being forced on the run, and Lefty will do anything that he can to ensure that happens while enshrining quoting the Prophet Muhammad in our schools. 916. And again, if you'd like to reach me today, a couple of ways you can actually do that. Some people do it by, by uh, a snail mail. Most do it by either telephone or they do it by email. And my email address is bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. That is bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. The last name is spelled C-O-L-L-E-Y. You can also reach us on the program by giving me a call at 736-0300, 736 736- Zero three hundred, But all of these things do tie in. And, and what happened this week at that school brings it home to us that what's going on around the world, whether it be halfway around the globe in North Africa or in the Middle East, that is parts of Asia, or whether it be happening in Washington, D.C. or in Birmingham, England, it's still close to home. It's, it's, it's going on here in Twin Falls. We are gradually being, it's like the weathering that you see when you go out You wouldn't see it all happen at once because it happens over thousands of years. But when you go out and you look over the canyon and you understand that there was a time long, long ago when that canyon didn't exist. But over time, between the weather and the rushing water, that canyon got eroded. Well, that's what they're trying to do to all of us. And it's not just the extremists who are currently wreaking havoc across part of the world but it's also happening right here in more subtle ways in our schools. And when it's happening, my friends, to children who are six, seven, and eight years old, you've got to have more say in what's going on in the school system. A couple of quick notes. We have a break coming up in just a short while. You'll hear from some of our fine sponsors. Also, I have some news, too, if we get to it coming up a little later in the program. Study from the Cato Institute Uh, on illegal immigration, says it might not be so bad in the long run for the Republican Party. Also, uh, more more talk going on at the state capitol about uh, eliminating a concealed carry permit in Idaho. We'll get to those, I hope, in the next 40 minutes or so on the program. But first, these announcements. Uh, A young woman who I met over the weekend sharing a couple of things with me. She uh, dropped by our booth at the home show, and she says, first, on March 24th and 25th, Pastor, and I can't really read this, I believe it's Sharam Hadian, will be in Boise to speak at the Boise Church of Christ. I hope I got the name right there, but not sure on times and locations yet. He is a former Muslim who is now a Christian pastor and does an excellent presentation. And She says, we have had him here before. You can learn more about him from a website that he has. I may be able to post that at the KLIX Facebook page a little later today, too, as well. Second, Bridget Gabriel, and you may be familiar with Bridget Gabriel if you, if you catch her on Fox News from time to time, and some of her videos on YouTube are just outstanding, where she tells her family's own story in Lebanon and when they were driven out by the, uh, the Islamic fundamentalists. She is the founder and president of ACT for America. She'll be making a presentation at the Deer Flat Church in Caldwell on May 7th at 7 p.m. She is truly a dynamic person and speaker. And uh, Kelly Cook will probably probably be coming with her. So uh, those two uh, two notes of things coming up next month. And also, it looks as if on March 19th, we are going to be joined by uh, Arthur Thompson, who is the CEO, current CEO of the John Birch Society, which has been marginalized even by a great many people on the right. Albeit, if you listen to them, they sound just like any other conservatives. And he's going to be doing some presentations in Idaho as well. So we're looking forward to a visit from him, whether by telephone or in studio, coming up a little later in the month of March. 20 minutes after 9 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, 35 at our studios. What's the safest place to live in America if there happens to be a zombie attack? <laughs> well, they're having one in Iraq and Syria right now. Um, oh, not that kind of zombie. All right. Well, researchers, uh, you talk about, of course, money well spent at a college. Researchers at Cornell University. Now, they're not really 
doing this for a zombie attack. This is a study in a pandemic that might happen and what would happen in this country if it quickly swept through uh, cities and, and various areas. What's the best place to live? Well, this was on Fox News, found it on the website yesterday. Major cities could be toast within days, but less populated areas could be unaffected for weeks, and the northern mountain time zone could be safe for months. And then the writer says by that time, the disease could attenuate. That is, uh, its spread could stop. Everybody who has it could be dead. So if you're living in the northern stretch of the mountain time zone, gee, that would be here. You would be probably in best shape of surviving it. Nice to know. Uh, on the other hand, we'd lose a Congress probably and <clears throat> some other things like that. It would start on the East Coast, most likely, they say, versus the West Coast. And that the isolation that we have that provides us, uh, uh, I guess, an almost inoculation against it, would at least keep us alive for a while and, and maybe even help us figure out how to stay alive instead of uh, coming down with it just someday out of nowhere and then dropping dead within a few days. Shades of a book I once read, later made into a movie by Stephen King, where uh, a, a virus genetically engineered gets out of control and pretty well wipes out uh, the entire planet. A handful of decent people are left and a handful of really nasty people are left, and then they duke it out at the, uh, the end. And uh, it all ends with a nuclear explosion in Las Vegas. But for some reason, being a liberal, he put all the good people in Boulder, Colorado. I don't know. If I, wa if I was going to lead a community of the good people, I might be thinking, I don't know, Marathon, Florida? Just saying it's probably a lot nicer there year-round, other than hurricane season. But if you're one of the good people, you might be protected. 926, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. 35 at our studios. I want to thank you for joining us this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX as well as newsradio1310.com online, meaning you can hear us anywhere around the world. And if you'd like to give me a telephone call this morning, we've been kind of bouncing around on a few topics, hammering away at one, of course. 736-0300, that number is 736-0300. Update on constitutional carry, that is being able to carry a firearm, concealed firearm in Idaho without having to get a note from your mother, I mean a permit. The chairman of the House State Affairs Committee says his family and the families of other committee members are being harassed by backers of a proposed law to allow Idaho residents to carry concealed weapons without a permit. Now, I've been talking to a lot of people about this over the last several days, and we all agree. We, we, we back the idea, although the majority do believe that people should take at least a safety course first, and, and that that safety course would, of course, assist them as well. Uh, because we don't want people running around out there, especially liberals who wouldn't know how to handle firearms. Backers of the law are telling individuals to call legislators to urge a hearing to be held on the bill. Why did you get elected to government in the first place? It's not harassment if people are just asking you to support it. 927, you're on the air on News Radio 1310 KLIX. What's up with you? Hey, uh, Bill, uh, this uh, calling Idaho a Christian nation, a Christian state, you know, America used to be called a Christian nation. Yes. But by the weaponization of the Word of God through the military-industrial complex, now they've been able to get through, get rid of all of that by bringing, by pushing this idea, the words of Paul, that we're under grace and not law, and misteaching it to say that we're not supposed to touch God's law. So now we've got to live by the legalism of this evil, corrupt, anti-Christ government. When the president himself goes to Cairo and stands on the, uh, the biggest learning institute uh, at the Cairo University in the middle of the Muslim world and says that we are an atheist country, do you know how that is read by people elsewhere? Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and for all the people who say, well, I think he's a closet Muslim, no, he's an atheist himself. I clearly believe that. I don't think he believes in anything but himself. I think that he... Uh, he obviously hates America. There's no question about that. Funny, somebody said that last week and got a lot of media attention, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for the call, sir. 929. We have a short break coming up in just a few minutes. Half an hour of the show still ahead. When Giuliani said he's not a patriot, though, Giuliani didn't say he hates America. Giuliani didn't say that he didn't love America. He just said he's not a patriot. There is a difference. 
Media doesn't like to tell you that, though, do they? They just try to make it sound as if, oh, they're being, those racist whiteys are being so mean again to our half-black president. And he's so Mr. Transformational Change. What do they fear? Well, we fear the communists. And we brought it up yesterday. I saw it on a blog post a couple of days ago. If you don't have any doubts, that's one thing. But if you if you think we're blowing smoke when we say Barack Obama is a Marxist-Leninist, if you gave him a choice of a government with an economy run by the free market or a government that controlled the market, which one would he take? There's your answer. There's your answer. So there's no question about it. Hillary Clinton, same thing. Elizabeth Warren, same thing. John Kerry, same thing. 9.30, Bill Colley with you this morning. News Radio 1310, KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. Email me at bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. Illegal immigrants, could they end up being Republican voters if we have a general amnesty? More details ahead. Big snowstorm that hit the southeast and uh, middle Atlantic. And, of course, when they think big snowstorm, two inches, closes everything. Fox is uh, doing a story about it this morning. And a reporter standing in two inches of snow in a place called Cartersville, Georgia. Now, judging by that, I would say it's named after somebody named Carter. And who do I know named Carter from Georgia? Yeah, wimps. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. Two inches of snow shuts everything down. 934, Bill Colley with you on Top Story, News Radio 1310, KLIX, News 1310.com online, meaning you can hear us anywhere all over the planet. 35 at our studios. In the waning portion of our program today, a few things I still wanted to mention just to get this out there. Uh, you know that your uh, friends in the Republican Party uh, could be nicknamed the cavemen because they cave all the time to uh, mainstream media and to, of course, the White House. From the Washington Examiner, and they're caving on amnesty. It's it's going to happen because they tell you one thing. Oh, we're learning them good down in Washington. While at the same time, lobbyists are coming in saying, hey, my business would do really well with all of this really cheap labor to drive down wages. Here's a check for your next campaign. You can go out and tell everybody that you don't like the idea, but just as long as you go along with us, play it good for a while, pretend you're opposed, and then, then at the last minute, you know, drop your opposition. From the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank in Washington, a new study released by Cato shows that immigrants are remarkably politically similar to native-born Americans. I will say one thing. They go to church in much bigger numbers. They likely work like the, uh, the, the Dickens. You know, I mean, they just go out and go to a job. There's a friend of mine told me one time when he used to uh, observe them at housing projects, he said, you got the Latino crews that show up and they just start working. He said, and then all my white guys show up and they all stand around waiting to be told what to do. <laughs> now, that might be a generalization, but he told me that there was a reason we have a great many Latin workers in this country. After all, when they've been making you know peanuts for picking some plants in fields and suddenly you tell them, I'll give you seven, eight, 10, 15 bucks an hour for this job, the lights go off in their head and they say, uh-huh. The writer goes on to say immigrants are slightly different from native-born Americans in party identification. Well, we knew that. Compared to fourth-generation Americans, new immigrants are equally likely to identify as Democrats, less likely to be Republicans, and much more likely to be independents. But by the second and third generation, the differences with the fourth generation are so small that they are statistically insignificant. Well, that's grand, but that'll be 80 to 100 years before it would balance out from Democrats a newfound Democrats waiting for Santa Claus, to Republican voters. So it's not going to benefit you. It's not going to benefit your children and probably even your grandchildren. Somewhere down the road, though, what they're saying is uh, the immigrant population would be voting Republican. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> a century from now. <laughs> how, how does that, again, how does that benefit me in any way? Well, it doesn't. All right. Good to know. But the Cato Institute, if being, being a very libertarian organization, would probably like to see that border just vanish and just have people go back and forth. One of my former co-workers left the United States, renounced her citizenship, and she's living in Acapulco now because she said no government should be able to hold back her talents, which none of us were aware of when we worked with her, but uh, <clears throat> you know, to each his own. You're on the air on News Radio 1310 KLIX, newsradio13.com as well. And what's on your mind? 
Uh, Bill, I work with a lot of immigrants, and they're hardworking people. They're they're good working people. I would trade them in a second for a bunch of whiteies on the assembly line of the dole out any day of the week. Why is that? And and the uh, the whole thing is is it's it's the media and everything else that keeps them on the democratic side. Because I think if you really sat down with one and had an intellectual talk on what they're looking for here in the USA. They would want to be Republican. But there's a problem in the Republican side because half of them are really Democrats with an R on the end of their name. Yes. And it's causing a problem. Most of them want to make things work. They're willing to work for the money they get, and they want to make their lives better. Does that sound like a Democrat or a Republican? And here's another thing. When it comes to their beliefs— uh, most of them are either Pentecostal or Roman Catholic, and they are very, very conservative in both those faiths. And if you went to them and said, how do you feel about same-sex marriage? <laughs> They'd look at you and think, what are you talking about? So on the, on, the, on the social issues, they are much more Republican than they are Democrats. Right, but the Democrats have, have talked to them about handouts and stuff, and, the, and they're poor. I mean, they're looking for something. So, I mean, you're, you're dealing with emotion instead of reality. I think if we could work out a deal where we could scoop all the drug dealers up in our big major cities and make a what trade. I think is, you know what I think, Bill? Our Republicans need to get on the stick and say what they stand for. I guarantee you, if the conservative Republicans every day would get on, the, on TV and say what they stand for and what we want the country to become, Things would change in a hurry. I'd but agree. No, they're all a bunch of scaredy cats. Well, you know, John Boehner's their spokesperson. <laughs> so, Raul, you sit down over there. I don't care about any tea party here from Idaho. Get out of my way. Mr. Boehner is being challenged, however. Uh, it may not be over with. He, he may have been resoundingly sent back to his position as uh, Speaker of the House. But according to The Hill today, he is going to be once again challenged if he caves on a couple of big-time issues. Hey, Mike Huckabee's up in about 10 minutes right here on KLIX. It's 940. Oh, music from what was a great movie. Sylvester Stallone uh, was in, what, five of those? Two of them were actually pretty good, number one and number three. The best movie I think he ever made was a movie called Copland. In fact, uh, people who didn't think he could act were stunned by how good he was in that picture. I just saw it on TV a few weeks ago. Worth watching or renting if you get an opportunity and you haven't seen it yet. Happen to see something today at Accuracy in Media that I, I wanted to share with you very quickly. I've been checking my internet here during the show in case I have an email. You can email me at bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. And the last name is spelled C-O-L-L-E-Y. So I periodically check my email while I'm on the air. And also Facebook, people are sending me messages there as well. Uh, you can easily find me on Facebook. Uh, the name is just not, the last name is just not that common. I had to track down a friend recently, and his uh, name is uh, James Olson, which is actually quite a common name in the western United States. And he went to school with me when I was a kid. We got to be best friends in the sixth grade, and then graduated high school together, went to college for a couple of years together before he transferred to BYU. And he'd been born in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, then uh, ended up moving to my hometown because his mother got a job as assistant newspaper editor. And then after he got out of BYU, I believe he was living in Orem for a while. And then I know he did some grad work, I think, at the University of Washington. But you know what? He didn't leave much of a Google trail. Let me put it that way. And I searched and searched and searched because I figured he might be living in this area. When I moved here, I searched and searched and searched. Finally tracked him down in British Columbia. Went to the post office yesterday and sent him a letter via a snail mail. And I had to write Canada on it because they said if it just said B.C., that wasn't going to help out. So I had to write Canada below B.C. so they could figure that out. And it's, it's only $1.15, though, to send a letter across. You know why the Postal Service is in such trouble? Because it costs you the same amount of money to send a letter across town as it does to the state of Maine. But the letter to the state of Maine has to go quite a bit more distance now, doesn't it? If we had a graduated system, and yet I can send a letter for a buck fifteen across the border to British Columbia, 
But for under 50 cents, I can send a letter all the way to uh, Presque Isle, Maine. Figure that one out. It doesn't make any sense to me. 946, I am a former postal worker. Not necessarily qualified, though, to talk about these issues. 35 at our studios. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and also News Radio 1310.com on the web. The End of Freedom in America from Alan Karuba at Accuracy in Media. You know today the FCC is set to foist upon us ObamaNet versus Internet. And this could be very, very dangerous for the future of knowledge, free speech, uh, because they are going to be able to regulate what you say on the Internet. You can darn well bet on it. They already regulate what I say when I speak into this microphone, and they've been doing that for 81 years. Well, not my 81 years, but 81 years of radio. The FCC pretty much took over the broadcast airwaves in 1934 and has had a, a, a stranglehold on it ever since then. Well, now they're looking at gobbling up the Internet as well. And people all around the world are saying this is a dangerous, dangerous idea. In fact, it could eventually lead to, now this is an, an invention, ARPANET to Internet. Al Gore only helped facilitate it. He didn't invent it. But which was developed for military uses and then, of course, made available to the public on a worldwide basis. But it is still, even though someone will say, well, the French had something to do with it, it is still an American notion. But the idea is it could end up in the hands of the United Nations. God forbid that happens. But it could happen if the FCC takes it over. And a fellow by the name of Alan Karuba is citing a Wall Street Journal columnist, Gordon Krovitz, who summed up what will occur, saying ObamaNet promises to fix an Internet that isn't broken. The permissionless Internet, which allows anyone to introduce a website, app, or device without government review, ends today. That's what we're looking at. Now, one Democrat may end up bolting, and two Republicans are opposed, which could give three out of five votes against this happening. But I, I'm not really, it might all be for show. I, so much of government is any longer. Earlier this week, as reported, he writes by Giuseppe Macri in the Daily Caller, the FCC's two Republican commissioners asked the chairman to delay the vote and release his proposal to the public. He did not. He also spurned two congressional committees. He refused to show up to testify. Why didn't they just send out a subpoena? Have a federal marshal go over, grab the guy, slap him into cuffs, drag him down to Capitol Hill, put him in a chair and say, all right, you're going to talk now. And if you're not, the cameras are going to roll and the public is going to see just how sinister you really happen to be. But there you go again. The Republicans are talking a good game, but they don't follow through on anything. And as long as they don't, we're not going to, which only tells you that it's all about talk for positioning for election day. And perhaps they actually believe in all of this stuff, that they go along with all of it, that they, they like the idea of corralling the American people and, and squelching dissent. Gee, who'd have thunk that, that people in power would start to get drunk on power and that they would take that approach? There were some warnings about that from our founding fathers, but then again, they were old white men descended from Europeans. Some of them were slaveholders, and a couple may have been mean to their children, so we can't really you know, celebrate them any longer. No, we've got to have Muslim prayer in schools. That'll remedy everything, my friends, let me tell you. Just ask some folks in local education. The Huckabee Report is on the way, brought to you exclusively by the financial advisors at Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls. You can telephone them at 736-6563. Again, that number for Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls, 736-6563. Thank you very much, Governor Huckabee. And the Huckabee Report once more brought to you by the financial advisors of Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls, 736-6563. Hey, before we wrap today, saw a couple of things this morning. I think it was Viral Buzz is the name of the website. Two Hollywood movie stars, well, television star and movie star, may be trending rightward. See, when you wonder if there's ever going to be any hope, you see stories like this. There's a handful of people who are vocal about being Republicans or conservatives in Hollywood. Uh, Vince Vaughn uh, among them. He, just in the last few weeks, has been very vocal about his positions. Of course, Clint Eastwood, more libertarian, but still Republican, admitted that he pretty much always has voted Republican his entire life. You've got uh, Kelsey Grammer, of course, uh, famous for Frasier and uh, playing that character on Cheers as well. Uh, Robert Duvall was another one. Uh, so you've got a number of people in Hollywood who, 
they're rather a closeted group, uh, Tom Selleck as well. They don't, they don't necessarily get a lot of support. But this morning, according to Viral Buzz, Angelina Jolie, now remember her dad, John Voigt, started out as a Hollywood liberal and eventually became, he may be the leading conservative in Hollywood today. She has been, for most of her younger life, a liberal Democrat. But according to some people reporting in Us Magazine, she has recently been fighting with her liberal husband. He, uh, he of course, had left some other woman for her, if you recall. It was all over the, uh, the tabloid press way, way back uh, when he, uh, he bolted and left Jennifer Aniston uh, for the other woman. I don't know why. But he did that, and he is a flaming Obama liberal. She, on the other hand, has concluded that Obama is a socialist hell-bent on destroying America. Isn't that funny how she has reached? So it must be in the genes in her family. They start out one way, and then they drift to the right, and then all of a sudden a few big moments happen, and the light bulb goes off. And the other one is Charlie Sheen, who's had some problems with, you know, substance abuse. We'll put it that way in his life. Uh, then again, probably the type of guy who, uh, who has had a pretty good easy, easy life with his dad being in the acting business and the family had some money and he grew up likely with everything he wanted and, and all of those things. But then you go through certain experiences in life. You know a lot of people who are Christians today who used to be on the other side. Uh, they used to be leading lives, uh, terrible lives, uh, lives of debauchery, drunkenness, and the like. And and they their testimony is very important because it shows us that you can come late to the vineyard. Charlie Sheen gave an interview, and his father is one of the biggest socialists in all of California, if not all of America, maybe the world. And Charlie Sheen was talking about his political views, and somebody said, you sound like a Republican. And Charlie Sheen interrupted and said, Tell, tell you what, not a Republican, but a constitutional Republican. And he said, if we stick to the notions, the ideas that were brought forth by our founding fathers, then we'll be okay in this country. It's when we get away from that, that we find that we have a great many troubles. So there are people out there who are getting the wake up call ever, ever so slowly. If we could only find a few more in establishment media, who would start to actually see the light, we might have some hope, but we're still going to be fighting with them in 2016. We can hold all of the state houses, all of the state legislatures. We can hold every government outside of the major cities in the country. They'll still trend Democrat, of course, because everyone's waiting for Santa Claus. We could hold every county government. We could hold both houses of Congress. But when it comes to the presidency, we're fighting an uphill battle simply because so many people in media are so far to the left, they're practically falling over. Rush Limbaugh follows news at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock news from Fox. Sean Hannity up after the 1 o'clock news. Glenn Beck will be along after 4 o'clock news this afternoon. And God willing, and the creek don't rise, I will be back in this chair tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. My name is Bill Colley. Bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com.